A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center on June 3, sending a robotic Dragon cargo capsule toward the International Space Station. The cargo spacecraft carried experiments and a new set of solar panels for the space station. Approximately eight minutes after liftoff, the Falcon 9's first stage returned to Earth, landing on one of SpaceX's drone ships in the Atlantic Ocean in a smooth touchdown. Approximately 40 hours after lifting off from Cape Canaveral, on June 5, the cargo ship arrived at the International Space Station. The spacecraft autonomously linked up with the orbiting laboratory, parking at the zenith site of the station's Harmony module. The commercial resupply mission, designated CRS-22, carried 1,948 kilograms of pressurized cargo inside the spacecraft and an additional 1,380 kilograms of unpressurized cargo stored in its trunk section. The largest item the Dragon transported to the station is a pair of new solar arrays, called the ISS Rollout Solar Array. The arrays are stored in the Dragon's trunk rolled up and will be attached to the station's truss and rolled out. Astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Thomas Peskett are currently scheduled to perform spacewalks on June 16 and 20 to install those arrays. The arrays are the first two of six that will be installed on the station, overlaying part of the existing arrays. The Dragon also carried experiments such as gene studies of tardigrades, also known as water bears, a microscopic creature able to survive extreme environments. In a research titled, Understanding of Microgravity on Animal-Microbe Interactions, astronauts will investigate the effects of space flight on the molecular and chemical interactions between beneficial microbes and their animal hosts. The mission also carried many more investigations to the ISS, including a research that could help develop cotton varieties that require less water and pesticides. Check out the links in the description to learn more about the cutting-edge investigations delivered to the space station by the CRS-22 mission. On June 2, NASA selected two new missions to Venus as a part of their discovery program. The missions aim to understand how Venus became an inferno-like world when it has so many other characteristics similar to ours. Deep Atmosphere Venus Investigation of Noble Gases, Chemistry, and Imaging Plus, or Da Vinci Plus, will measure the composition of Venus's atmosphere to understand how it formed and evolved, as well as determine whether the planet ever had an ocean. The mission consists of a descent sphere that will plunge through the planet's thick atmosphere, making precise measurements of noble gases and other elements to understand why Venus's atmosphere is a runaway hothouse compared to the Earth's. In addition, Da Vinci Plus will return the first high-resolution pictures of the unique geological features on Venus, known as tesserae, which may be comparable to Earth's continents, suggesting that Venus has plate tectonics. This would be the first U.S.-led mission to Venus's atmosphere since Pioneer Venus Orbiter in 1978. Venus Emissivity, Radio Science, INSER, Topography, and Spectroscopy, or Veritas, will map Venus's surface to determine the planet's geologic history and understand why it developed so differently than Earth. Orbiting Venus with a synthetic aperture radar, Veritas will chart surface elevations over nearly the entire planet to create 3D reconstructions of topography and confirm whether processes such as plate tectonics and volcanism are still active on Venus. Veritas also will map infrared emissions from Venus's surface to map its rock type and determine whether active volcanoes are releasing water vapor into the atmosphere. In addition to the two missions, NASA selected a pair of technology demonstrations to fly along with them. Veritas will host the Deep Space Atomic Clock 2 that will ultimately help enable autonomous spacecraft maneuvers and enhance radio science observations. Da Vinci Plus will host the Compact Ultraviolet to Visible Imaging Spectrometer to make high-resolution measurements of ultraviolet light using a new instrument based on freeform optics. These observations will be used to determine the nature of the unknown ultraviolet absorber in Venus's atmosphere that absorbs up to half the incoming solar energy. The missions, which have each been awarded $500 million in funding, are due to launch between 2028 and 2030. Axiom Space, an American privately funded space infrastructure developer, has signed a contract with SpaceX for three additional crewed missions to the International Space Station aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule. Axiom, which already has a deal with SpaceX for the AX-1 mission to the ISS, said on June 2 that the new contract covers the projected AX-2, 3, and 4 missions to the station. American astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria will command Axiom-1 mission and Peggy Whitson will command the Axiom-2. The first two missions are slated to launch in 2022 and the next two missions no earlier than 2023. The crews of all four missions will receive combined commercial astronaut training from NASA and SpaceX. 
The actual dates and timings haven't been announced yet, as that is subject to NASA approval. Another detail that is unknown is the crew names for the last two missions and the financial agreement struck between SpaceX and Axiom. For Houston-based Axiom Space, founded in 2016 by veteran NASA ISS manager Mike Suffordini, these missions will serve as precursor missions ahead of the company's core project of building commercial ISS modules. NASA selected the company to provide a private module for the space station in January 2020. It will be a habitable module that will be attached to the forward port of the Harmony module of the space station in late 2024. The idea behind nuclear fusion research is to recreate the process that the sun uses to produce monumental amounts of energy, where intense heat and pressure combine to produce plasma in which atomic nuclei fuse at incredible velocities. Since the total mass of the resulting single nucleus is less than the mass of the two original nuclei, the leftover mass gets converted into energy. Today, many countries take part in fusion research to some extent. And last week, the Chinese Academy of Sciences Fusion Machine, named Experimental Advanced Superconducting Tokamak, reached 120 million degrees and clung onto this for 101 seconds. A tokamak is a reactor that uses a powerful magnetic field to confine the plasma to produce a controlled thermonuclear fusion reaction. The last time the machine held onto a writhing loop of plasma for so long was in 2017, but the temperature only reached a mere 50 million degrees Celsius. In 2018, the reactor held gas heated beyond the 100 million degree benchmark but could only sustain the plasma for around 10 seconds. Now that it held plasma at eight times the temperature of the sun's core for such a long period, the new record has nudged the world ever slightly closer to this elusive yet highly sought after clean power source. The challenge is to hold the plasma in place for long enough for fusion to occur. It needs to be even hotter than the sun, because our star's much stronger gravity helps squeeze the nuclei together, something we can't replicate here on Earth. The goal of the Chinese reactor is to hold plasma at around 100 million degrees Celsius for more than 1,000 seconds. With the theoretical potential to safely produce such vast amounts of energy without greenhouse gases and barely any radioactive waste, fusion power is considered by some as the holy grail of clean energy. However, at the moment, nuclear fusion is not yet a certainty, with a fully functioning artificial sun still likely decades away. We have yet to even reach the point where a fusion reactor can spit out more energy than it consumes, but some experts think we're getting close. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Ahead of the first orbital test flight of Starship, pre-flight groundworks are progressing rapidly at Starbase. The orbital launch mount received all its six leg caps last week. The first two leg caps were installed on May 31st. A crane lifted the caps and gently lowered them onto the launch mount legs. Later the workers welded them together. The third leg cap got installed on June 1st, the fourth one on June 3rd, and the fifth and sixth on June 5th. As usual, Lav Padre captured the events in high definition through his 24x7 online Starbase cameras. Now that all leg caps are installed, workers will next focus on placing the orbital launch table on the top of these structures. The launch table is currently situated at the build site and is undergoing pre-installation works. In the future, Starships will be launched atop the Super Heavy booster from this launch table. The launch table is currently receiving its booster hold-down clamps. Check out our previous update to learn more about these hold-down clamps, link in the description. In addition to the launch pad at Starbase, SpaceX is also planning to build an offshore rocket launch facility, also known as a floating spaceport. A year ago, SpaceX made headlines after posting job openings for operations engineers to help design and build the offshore launch facility. The company also brought two offshore oil rigs in July of 2020. After acquiring the rigs, sold by Valorous, they were renamed to Phobos and Deimos by SpaceX. The rigs SpaceX bought are classified as ultra-deep water semi-submersible, and they were sold for $3.5 million each. Both rigs are located in the port of Brownsville at the southern tip of Texas, near SpaceX's Starship Development Facility in Boca Chica. SpaceX is already underway on building its first floating spaceport platform, and Musk tweeted last week that rockets may launch from Deimos as soon as next year. That means it's only a matter of time until we see rockets launching off from converted oil rigs and heading for the moon, all corners of Earth, and Mars. At Starbase, near the land-based orbital launch pad, SpaceX is constructing an orbital launch tower, which helps in Starship stacking and super-heavy mid-air catch. The tower segments are built out of structural steel trusses, and the company has already installed three such segments on top of the other. Recently the construction of the fourth segment has completed, and last week, workers began assembling the fifth segment. 
These two segments will be transported to the launch site for installation in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, the already installed tower segments received an elevator on their inside last week. The elevator is essential to support the forthcoming assembly of the launch tower segments as the tower grows in height. Austin Bernard recently spotted rails on the pillars of the tower segment, leading to several speculations about the design of the booster catching mechanism. Twitter user Lunar Caveman suggested a possible booster catching technique. According to him, SpaceX may install carriages on three of the four pillars, with the catching arm mounted to one of the carriages. The carriages with flanged wheels will move up and down through the rails installed onto the pillars, carrying the booster with them. While the first super-heavy booster to be used in an orbital Starship flight is taking shape inside the high bay, a super-heavy test tank got rolled out to the launch site last Thursday. The test tank, named Booster BN 2.1, is expected to be pressure-tested to failure on a test stand at the launch site to validate production methods. During the test, the tank will be pressurized with cryogenic nitrogen until it bursts or leaks. The tank was rolled out on the same test stand on which the pressure tests will be conducted. Moreover, nine hydraulic thrust rams were pre-installed into the test stand before the tank got rolled out. These nine thrust rams will simulate the thrust of Raptor engines, while the test tank is undergoing a structural integrity test. Each ram presses with approximately 1,700 to 1,800 kilonewtons of force against the connections of the engine. Recently Cameron County officials issued an order to temporarily close State Highway 4 and Boca Chica Beach from June 7 to 9. The booster tank tests may take place during these days. Previously, SpaceX had planned to install 28 Raptors on a Super Heavy booster, with 20 engines on the outer ring and 8 on the inner ring. But, recently a Super Heavy thrust puck with an engine mounting point at its center was spotted at the construction site, indicating a possible extra engine on the booster. Elon Musk replied to this update by confirming that initially the booster will have 29 engines, which will be increased to 32 later this year. This means that, in a 29-engine configuration, Super Heavy will have nine inner engines installed into it, and the nine hydraulic rams we saw on the test stand were designed to mimic the force exerted by these engines. Meanwhile, in the case of 32-engine configuration, 12 engines will be installed on the inner ring in a 9 plus 3 pattern. According to Elon Musk, these 12 inner engines can be gimbaled together, and boost back burn efficiency is greatly improved in this configuration. Reagan, a local resident near SpaceX's McGregor Development Facilities, recently reported hearing a test of one of Starship's Raptor engines that lasted more than five minutes. If accurate, it could be the longest static fire of a Starship engine to date. Whether it was successful or not, a five- or six-minute static fire would confirm that SpaceX has completed an orbital duration static fire test, and the company is well into the process of qualifying Raptor for Starship's first orbital launch attempts. In its justification book released by the U.S. Air Force, as a part of the federal budget rollout, it is mentioned that the Air Force plans to invest $47.9 million into a project called Rocket Cargo. The documents state that the Department of the Air Force seeks to develop a fully reusable commercial rocket to deliver Air Force cargo anywhere on the Earth in less than one hour, with a 100-ton capacity. Although this does not refer to Starship by name, this is the only vehicle under development in the world with this kind of capability. According to the report, the Air Force does not intend to invest directly into the vehicle's development. However, it proposes to fund the science and technology needed to interface with the launch vehicle so that the Air Force might leverage its capabilities. The Air Force mainly plans to invest in designs to quickly load and unload a rocket, rapid launch capabilities from unusual sites, and investigation of the potential ability to airdrop a payload after re-entry. The Air Force is spending $9.7 million on these activities in the current fiscal year, but seeks to increase that total for the coming year as it moves into the test phase of the program. This clearly is an important contract for SpaceX, as the U.S. Department of Defense has near-limitless budgets and could become an important customer of Starship. Moving on to other Starship updates, Starship Serial No. 15, which got rolled back to the build site two weeks ago, is now resting on a display stand beside the factory that built it. A newly delivered header tank fixture was spotted at the build site by Starship Gazer. This fixture will help to accurately align the plates of the Starship header tank for welding. The construction of ground support equipment tanks 5, 6, and 7 are in progress at the factory. Recently the aft dome of Starship serial number 20 was spotted at the production site. The assembly of the oxygen tank section of Booster BN2 is in progress inside the high bay, and recently workers have begun installing the methane downcomer into the oxygen tank. 
With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.